chemical properties of soils. Chemical properties of soils is how soils provide nutrients to plants. Therefore, we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about cation exchange and anion exchange. And these become very important because this is the way the plant is going to pick up the nutrients that it needs from the soil. Exchange capacity, the ability of the material to hold ions that can be assimilated by the plants. We're looking at cation exchange capacity, anion exchange capacity. There are a lot of things out there in the soil that may not be necessary to the plant. The plant may take some of them up but they may leave a lot of them behind. We've got these membranes that determine when things are picked up. Ions, by definition, are electrically charged atoms. These are atoms that have gained or lost electrons. A cation has a net positive charge. An anion has a net negative charge. The capacity goes down to how much cations, how much anion can the soil hold and be able to exchange that. We're going to talk about atomic structure and ions. Our key says the yellow are going to be protons, the red are going to be electrons, the green will be neutrons. I have not drawn this to size or scale. I just want you to understand the concept. This is sodium, the sodium atom. It has an atomic number of 11. The atomic weight is 23. Therefore, it has got 11 protons, 12 neutrons, and 11 electrons. The electrons are scattered around the outside in what we call orbitals. On this side, we are going to have what we call chlorine. The atomic number is 17. The atomic weight is 35. Therefore, it's got 17 protons, 18 neutrons. 18 plus 17 gives us 35. And 17 electrons to balance out the 17 protons. That's what these atoms look like. These are both very reactive atoms. The outer shells are filled when you have eight electrons in them. Notice the sodium has one extra one. The chlorine has seven, which means it's deficient of one. Next thing we get is these two molecules come together. They share an electron. We call that a covalent bond. If you place this in water, they separate. When they separate, the sodium has given, it's not lent, but given its outer electron to the chlorine, the sodium is now a cation because it has got 11 protons and 10 electrons, which means it is now going to have a net positive charge. That one electron in the outer shell is now been given over to the chlorine. The chlorine is now an anion because it has 17 protons, but 18 electrons, which means it now has a net negative charge. We have the cation and the anion in here. If these dry down, what will happen is you take the water out of this, they will come back together as the NaCl. If you put it in water, they disassociate, they create these cations and anions. These parts are very important. This is the concept this gets applied to other types of materials. When we look at clays and organic matter. Kaolinite is considered to be a one-to-one -one lattice clay. It has got 3 to 15 milliequivalents per milligram. Montmorillonite is a two-to-one lattice clay. It's got 80 to 100 equivalent milligrams per material. Organic matter, you're looking at 150 to 500 equivalent milligrams. This is a measure of our cation exchange capacity. When we look at soil, if we want a rich soil, we want to have a lot of organic matter in it. We don't necessarily want to have something like kaolinite in it. When you take your soil and you send it off, they will often analyze how much of each one of these you will get. This is going to show you what happens. We've got our soil particle or organic matter on the top. In there, there are a bunch of negative charges. We've got our soil solution, which has things like ammonium and iron and magnesium and potassium and calcium in it. They have got positive charges to them. These are going to be attracted by the negative charges up on the soil. We've got our plant root down here. The plant root is going to allow carbon dioxide out. The carbon dioxide and water form carbonic acid. This will very readily disassociate into a bicarbonate atom and a hydrogen. Notice the hydrogen has a positive charge to it. There is a pecking order in here, which means that certain things will get dislodged first by the hydrogen ion. The hydrogen comes in here. It's going to pick on that potassium. 
it knocks the potassium off as it knocks the potassium off, the material up on the top stays the same because we've got the same number of ions being picked up there. The potassium is now soluble in the soil solution where it can be absorbed by the plant. It moves into the plant root where the plant root can now use it. These hydrogen ions, which are generated by the plant, dislodge this material and allow that ion to be absorbed by the plant root. You can have diffusion where we've got excess hydrogen ions coming out of the plant root it diffuses across it's going to dislodge another ion as it does that ion is now going to come across this is cation exchange capacity this is the way plant roots absorb materials the other parts anion exchange capacity we know that the soil organic matter has a bunch of negative charges to it because the hydroxy units on it, as it's got negative charges, it's always trying to pick things up. In this particular case, we can see some of these, like the iron, the magnesium, the calcium, have one charge being associated with the organic matter, but they also have a couple of free charges on the outside. This will allow things like sulfate, nitrate, and phosphate to be attracted to them. This is where we get an anion exchange capacity. The more material you've got that's got positive charges, the more anions you can hold. If you don't hold these anions up, what will happen is they will often be removed from the soil in a process that we call leaching. They often talk about equivalent milligrams or milliequivalents. Exchange capacity is based on charge. The amount of charge we have is basically what we call the milliequivalents or the equivalent milligrams. Some elements have a single charge, potassium, sodium, chlorine. Some elements have a double charge, calcium, magnesium, sulfate. Some have a triple charge, iron. We've got to know what's going on in here. One equivalent milligram of potassium is one milligram of potassium. What we're looking at is charge. If we have something like calcium, one equivalent milligram of calcium is actually one half milligram of calcium ions. What we're looking at is charge. In one half milligram of calcium ions, you have the same amount of charge as you will in one milligram of potassium. So when we talk about equivalent milligrams in soil, we're looking at how material is picked up and how material material is moved around, it's based on charge. When we analyze soil, we flood it with hydrogen ions and that knocks everything else off. We can figure out what we've got and what our milli equivalents of the material is. If we look at root structure, this is a cross section of a root. What we find is we've got two pathways. We've got the symplast and we've got the apoplast. The symplast is through the centers of the cells. The apoplast is between the cells up until it reaches the Casparian strip where it automatically gets loaded into a cell and it gets migrated through the cell based on where it has been loaded in. The symplast is in the green the apoplast is in the yellow. Some material is picked up in the symplast, which means it gets picked up very quickly. Some material diffuses in through the apoplast, which means it goes in very slowly. There are materials that the plant does not need that will get picked up through the apoplast and will hang in on the outside of the plant. The other material that the plant needs, the quicker it can get it into the symplast, the quicker it is able to move it upwards. The other part we have to look at in here is the influence of soil pH on nutrient availability. What we've got here is a standard type chart that shows relative amounts of materials at different acidity. We want to be able to grow things at a place where everything is optimally available. We really can't get that. At a pH of 7, you can notice that nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and sulfur and calcium and boron and copper and molybdenum are all at their maximum. As you start to go up or down from there, some of these things vary out tremendously. Iron is much more available at a lower pH than at a higher pH, whereas molybdenum is much more available at a higher pH than it is at a lower pH. One of the key things to look at is once you get down below about a pH of 4.5, 
you start limiting out the ability of things to be available and get picked up, which means that's not a good soil to have plant growth in. Normally, when we talk about a good soil, we're talking about a pH between 5.5 and 6.5, half a pH below, half a pH above. Some soils can actually be alkaline soils, and they're just as bad as acidic soils. Sometimes we have to be able to alter our pH in the soil, and we'll talk about how that works pH has a big effect on plants and the availability of different materials for the plant. We're going back to the chemical properties of soil. 